The never-ending story was originally a book written by Michael Indy. Michael Indy was a German-born artist and student of Anthroposophy. Anthroposophy is the belief of a possible direct connection with the hidden realities and God through inner spiritual work and even merging the inner worlds with the physical reality. His study of Anthroposophy explains the immense amount of esoteric symbolism in the never-ending story. We're going to be going over the movie. It should be noted that Michael Indy hated the film adaptation of his book until his dying day. And though most would agree that the book is better, it doesn't change the fact that the movie is easy to fall in love with and that it was a childhood milestone for many of us that will never be forgotten. But get the book and read it, or listen to the audiobook. The movie begins with a boy named Bastion, who awakens from a dream and proceeds to tell his materialistic, realistic father about its contents. The father represents material and exoteric belief systems. The left brain, even criticizing Bastion to get your head out of the clouds and plant your feet on the ground. Bastion here represents imagination and creativity, the right brain. The word Bastion evolved from the French word Bastir, which means to build, and is defined as a protrusion of a fortress to aid the defenders and ward off the attackers. Throughout the movie, Bastion is symbolic of the conscious mind, the observer of phenomena, at first just in the physical world, but eventually in both the physical reality and realms of the subconscious. In the dialogue with Bastion's father, we learn here that the mother has died, and this greatly affects Bastion. On his way to school, Bastion is stopped by three bullies, who throw him into a garbage dumpster and call him names. The choice of having three bullies can represent a multitude of things. They could be symbolic of three vices which constantly plague the conscious mind, like ignorance, greed, and groupthink. After fleeing from the bullies, Bastion ends up in a bookstore, in which the old owner stops him from taking a special book. Secretly, the owner really wants Bastion to take the book, and when he turns his back, Bastion is gone, book in hand. The old store owner is symbolic of the keepers of esoteric wisdom. They do not release their hidden wisdom unto the world, but unto those who seek it, are pure of heart, and are ready to receive the wisdom. The symbol on the book is that of the double Ouroboros. The single Ouroboros is the snake biting its own tail in the form of a circle. The double Ouroboros represents the infinite balance of the upper and lower natures of being. Bastion runs to school and skips his math class to run up to the school's attic and read the book. Skipping math class is emblematical of throwing aside logical left brain limited teachings for creative right brain unlimited thought. Reading in the attic is symbolic of the initiate who retreats from the world to learn and progress in his spiritual studies. We have seen this in almost every religious savior or prophet from around the world. From Jesus, to Buddha, to Muhammad, we even see it in Batman Begins. Once Bastion begins reading the book, from this point on in the movie, we switch between the book's narrative and Bastion's real-life narrative. In the book, we are introduced to a world called Fantasia. Fantasia is symbolic of the subconscious mind. It represents imagination, creativity, and the astral planes. We first meet a few mythological fantasy-themed characters in the tropical forest. The Mad Hatter, who rides a racing snail, says he's from the west, the direction of the element of water. The Troll and the Bat are from the south, the direction of the element of fire. The humongous Rockbiter says he's from the north, the direction of the element of earth. The Rockbiter is the first to mention the antagonist in the movie called The Nothing. The Nothing devours all creation and leaves nothing behind. It is symbolic for the esoteric concept of primitive evil, which is called Chaos, Hali, or Ain. Chaos wishes to dismantle all of creation back into the infinite. We learn that these three characters are heading east to the ivory tower where the Empress lives, the apparent ruler and soul of Fantasia, seeking her help. The east holds much symbolism, some of which include the rising sun, God, Jesus, Horus, light, creation, hope, and birth. The east is also symbolic of the element of air. We are shown a glimpse of the ivory tower which is lit up with bright light upon a mountain, has a river flowing beside it amongst a lush forest, and is in front of a rising sun. On top of the ivory tower, there's three touching circles forming a triangle. 
This represents a multitude of symbolism, such as the Holy Trinity, the first three spheres on the Tree of Life, Kether, Chakma, and Bana, the three symbolic supports of Freemasonry, and the Father, Mother, and Son. Above the three circles is a fountain inside of a lotus flower. Above the fountain is a rose. This could refer to a form of the rosy cross or the origin of life. The Empress is not only a tarot card representing fertility, femininity, the giver, and the womb of life, but in Fantasia, she is the ultimate ruler of the realm. In the tower, we learn that a hero named Atreyu is on the way to begin his quest to save the Empress who has fallen ill. A young boy dressed in a garb similar to a Native American's and who looks similar to Bastion enters through the crowd. After being laughed at, he finally gains respect and is told he must divest himself of his weapons and company to succeed in his quest. Atreyu represents the conscious observer of the subconscious realms, the astral planes and dreams. At first separated from Bastion, symbolic of our lack of control over our dreams and the astral, but ultimately we are both Atreyu and Bastion when we understand and gain control. The quest Atreyu embarks on is emblematical of our search for inner wisdom and ultimate union with God. We must do this by ourselves, without any weapons or armor. Atreyu is given a double Ouroboros necklace to guide him on his journey, the same symbol on the cover of the book. Atreyu rides his white horse off through many different landscapes, symbolic of the endless realms of dreams and imagination. At this point, we are introduced to another antagonist, this time a physical being, Gamork, the evil wolf. The wolf is out to kill Atreyu, symbolic of our own fears and limitations. Atreyu, after unsuccessfully searching the landscapes for the cure, dismounts and walks with his horse through the Swamp of Sadness. The white horse eventually sinks into the swamp and dies, leaving Atreyu by himself. He stumbles upon a large mound in the middle of the Swamp of Sadness, who is the Ancient One, who holds the knowledge of the cure. The turtle is allergic to the boy and keeps saying, I don't care about anything, and what's the point of trying? This allusion is to the parts of our mind or others who are lazy, pessimistic, or weak, or to the branch of philosophic thought which believes life is meaningless. After telling Atreyu the Southern Oracle knows the cure, he then states she is 10,000 miles away, disheartening the boy. The Ancient One submerges and Atreyu continues through the Swamp of Sadness, draining his energy and eventually sucking him down below the surface. The swamp represents depression, sadness, and the peril of basking in these thoughts, which can literally stop your progression in life and possibly lead to suicide or death. Just as the boy is almost fully submerged, the evil wolf dashes and leaps at him, but instantly the clouds clear and Falcor the Luck Dragon swoops down and saves Atreyu. Falcor is silly, intelligent, hopeful, courageous, morally good, and represents both our higher selves and the full tarot card. This scene is symbolic of just when we think we have hit rock bottom and there is no hope. Our higher self or inner light emerges and saves us. I believe this scene is emblematical of the death and ascension of the soul, for Atreyu wakes up clean-heeled and cuddled next to Falcor, like a child in his father's arms. Also, Falcor states that he has brought Atreyu 9,891 of the 10,000 miles needed for his quest. That leaves 9, the number of the subconscious, Yisad, and the creation completed. The reason Falcor, or the Higher Self, did not bring Atreyu all the way to the Southern Oracle was because Atreyu, us, has to complete the journey by himself and pass the test without help. Here we meet two gnomes who live in a cave, a man and his wife named Ingiwuk and Urgul. Ingiwuk represents the alchemist. His house is full of flasks, potions, books, and alchemical experiments. The gnomes are extremely excited to see Atreyu and instruct him on how to get to the Southern Oracle, who resides in the alley after passing through two gates, or tests, successfully. The first test is walking through a narrow corridor in between two golden carobs. One needs self-confidence and courage, otherwise the carobs open their eyes and shoot at the stranger, killing him. Dead. The Kirubs can see directly through one's heart, and we are shown a knight in armor who is killed trying to pass through. Emblematical that even strong physical armor cannot save you if you have a weak heart, or you are fearful. The two Kirubs and the narrow corridor is the picture on the moon tarot card, which is the passageway from the physical life to the higher realms. The two Kirubs have large wings, each in the shape of a crescent moon, and are also statues on the Ark of the Covenant in the Bible. Atreyu runs into the valley and stops before the two Kirubs. Ingiwuk becomes frightful and doubts him, and even Atreyu begins to fear and doubt himself after seeing the skeleton of a dead warrior. 
The Kirib's eyes begin to open and Atreyu finally gains the inner strength to run through, just missing the bolts from the Kirib's. The second test Atreyu must pass is the Magic Mirror, which reflects the true self and can be very frightful to people who deny parts of their past or certain acts that they have committed. Esoterically, the Magic Mirror is known as the Dweller on the Threshold, who is the worst aspects of our personality in demon form. To accept and understand this part of ourselves and merge with it is the only way we can pass through, creating unity from duality. Now, treading through a snowstorm, Atreyu encounters the magic mirror. After looking deep inside, his reflection becomes transparent and he sees Bastion looking back at him. Throughout the movie, effects from Bastion's reality are experienced in Fantasia, and vice versa, hinting at the connection between reality and the subconscious. Bastion is at first scared, but continues reading, and Atreyu walks through the mirror, symbolically merging with Bastion, or in esoteric terms, the consciousness of the physical self is merged with the consciousness of the subconscious realms. Atreyu enters into another narrow passageway with two Kirabs, like before, except now they are blue, and the sun is shining in the far background, and he finds out that the Kirabs are the Southern Oracle. They are symbolic of the secrets of our subconsciousness we may discover through union with our physical consciousness. The Southern Oracle tells Atreyu that only a human boy must rename the Empress to save her. After they tell him the secret, they begin disintegrating. At this point, the nothing has taken over almost all of Fantasia. Falcor takes Atreyu across the realm into the Sea of Possibilities. Falcor loses Atreyu in the storm and he awakens on the island beach amidst the Sea of Possibilities, without his necklace. In the meantime, Falcor is searching for him. The Sea of Possibilities represents Bana, or the Abyss on the Tree of Life, the consciousness and possibility of all. The island is symbolic of Kether, or Chakma, on the Tree of Life. The only way to pass through, or pass the tests of the Abyss and Bana, is to dissolve one's ego and merge with the All, defeat one's fears, and reform on the other side of the island. This must be done without the Higher Self, which is why Falcor is separated from Atreyu at this point. The Nothing has almost completely devoured Fantasia. On the island, Atreyu sees cave drawings of the past, present, and future. This is emblematical of the Akashic Records, a location in the upper realms like a library of all the events, thoughts, and experiences of creation. As Atreyu looks at the drawings, he sees one of the evil wolf. To make things worse, the wolf emerges from the cave behind him. The wolf mocks and threatens Atreyu, but surprisingly gives him some helpful information. The wolf says that he is a servant of the Nothing, and helps the Nothing because weak minds are easy to control and dominate. He also informs Atreyu that Fantasia has no boundaries, and that it's made up by people's hopes and imaginations. Then the wolf leaps at Atreyu, but Atreyu stabs him in the heart with a sharp rock, killing him. Dead. Falcor finds the necklace in the sea and saves Bastion just as the Nothing destroys the island and everything else. Flying through space, Atreyu and Falcor search for the Ivory Tower, and find it floating amidst the ruins. Everyone and everything has been absorbed by the Nothing except the Empress, the Ivory Tower, Atreyu, and Falcor. We meet the Empress for the first time inside her chamber. She is a young girl, adorned with the crown, and her skin looks fair, symbolizing innocence and purity. Her chamber is emblematical of the Alchemist's Bridal Chamber, where the union of male and female take place. The chamber is filled with light and Falcor waits outside, symbolizing the higher self cannot help at this point. Bastion, in his reality, realizes that he knows the Empress's name and he must call it out to save Fantasia, but hesitates because his father criticized his imagination, symbolic of mainstream belief against esoteric teachings. Once Bastion gets enough courage, he screams out, Moonchild, the new name of the Empress. After a screen of blackness, the camera zooms out, showing the Empress and Bastion in the dark and the Empress is holding a glowing grain of sand. This scene is symbolic of the union of male and female producing a child. It also represents the union of conscious and subconscious minds and the great work completed. The Empress says, in the beginning, it's always dark. The first verse of Genesis should immediately come to the forefront of the mind. She says that in the beginning, only a grain of light is present and gives it to Bastion. He asks her if the whole journey was worthless and she responds, it isn't, and that only through wishing and this tiny grain of sand can the universe be fashioned again. Spiritually, this is emblematical of Purusha, awakening from his slumber and recreating reality through his memory and vision. This emotional scene is the crowning of the Prince Tipperith unto the father's throne, Kether. Bastion is told he has to rebuild Fantasia with his mind and has unlimited amount of wishes. Next we see Bastion riding upon Falcor in the physical world 
and they chased the bullies into the same garbage dumpster they threw Bastion into. Bastion has become the esoteric magician, the controller of the elements, manipulator of reality, consumer of the great work, and possessor of the wisdom that thoughts and dreams must begin in the subconscious to manifest in the physical world. Now he can do anything and everything. The NeverEnding Story is a classic and invaluable film for both the occultist and average person. The symbolism and storyline is so deep, so insightful, and so entertaining that it can be watched again and again without boredom or complete understanding of the symbolism thereof. I have shown how this film expresses symbolism of the Kabbalah, mystic Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Freemasonry, esoteric spirituality, occultism, psychology, philosophy, death, immortality, alchemy and the great work, consciousness, and subconsciousness. Only through uniting the consciousness and the subconsciousness can we complete the great work, enabling us to become master magicians and completely empowering us to understand and control reality and also our life's path. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I am not religious, but I am spiritual. I find myself utterly drawn to ancient knowledge that has been lost over time, and I believe that there cannot be good without evil. But that's another story.